So go ahead, Dr. Rollins. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. I'm really happy you're all joining us this evening. Tonight, we're going to talk about minimally invasive treatment option for heel pain. So I have no disclosures. And to start with heel pain, heel pain is one of the most common things I see. And a lot of patients will come in and say, oh, you know, I've been told I have a heel spur. Oops. Sorry about that. Now, with heel spurs, um, they generally form at the back of the heel where the Achilles tendon attaches, and also at the bottom of the heel where the plantar fascia attaches. The reason heel spurs form is because over time, with chronic tightness of your calf muscles, the Achilles tendon chronically pulls on the back of the heel and the body responds by building that spur. On the bottom of the foot where the plantar fascia attaches, over time, with chronic tugging and pulling of the plantar fascia away from the heel bone, again, the body responds by forming that heel spur. Now, in the majority of cases, it's not necessarily the heel spur that hurts. It's actually the soft tissue that's attached to that spur. Again, at the back of the heel, it will be the Achilles tendon, and at the bottom of the heel, it will be the plantar fascia. Now, when we're considering plantar fasciitis, most patients will feel a burning, an aching, or a throbbing sensation at the bottom of the heel. There are some common causes of the plantar fasciitis. Uh, I do see it in a lot of patients with flat feet because over time as that arch collapses, the fascia, which is attached to the bottom of the heel, chronically tugs and pulls, and it can cause little micro tears and inflammation in that plantar fascia as demonstrated in this close-up on the picture here on the right. And that can be very, very painful condition, and that is plantar fasciitis. I can also see it in patients with high arch feet because with a very high arch, you tend to hit the ground very hard and fast with that heel. And it's a very poor shock absorber. So that plantar fascia will take a lot of stress uh, while you're walking or exercising and it can cause a lot of that inflammation as well. It's also possible to injure your plantar fascia. If you stepped off a curb awkwardly, if you were running up steps and you slipped, uh, during a sporting activity, like basketball or soccer, anything that can put an awkward amount of stress on that fascia can cause it to become injured. I do also see plantar fasciitis occur in patients who do not wear shoes that give them enough support uh, while they're doing a lot of walking or exercising. Uh, I especially see this in my patients with flat feet uh, because again, with a poorly supportive shoe and you already have an arch that's collapsing, it's going to put a ton of stress on that plantar fascia. In addition, uh, not having enough arch support to give that plantar fascia lift while you're walking in active, again, will put a ton of stress at the insertion. And then another common problem in people with plantar fasciitis is, is tight calf muscles. And with a tight calf, it doesn't allow your ankle to move as well through the gait cycle when you're walking. So again, it will put a ton of stress on that plantar fascia when you're actually walking. There are some general treatments that I do recommend. The uh, most common one is stretching. And when patients come into the office, I usually will go through a stretching protocol with them. I do also recommend arch supports to put into the shoes as well to help give that plantar fascia some lift and take the stress off its insertion. People with plantar fasciitis can also get straining in the middle of the plantar fascia as well. Supportive shoes are also important to help offer good shock absorption and support throughout the arch. If you're able to take them medically, if you don't have any medical uh, conditions that would prevent you from doing so, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can be helpful also, such as Advil, Aleve, those types of medications. 
patients can also respond to ice or heat. And in a lot of situations, I also recommend physical therapy, where I will give a patient a prescription to go see the physical therapist to really work on stretching the fascia and uh, releasing the uh, tightness and calming down the inflammation. Injections is another treatment that's available, and that's referring to a steroid injection. Now, with steroid injections, I am very careful about giving those. I don't like to go to them as my first line of treatment because there are potential risks. It can cause the plantar fascia to rupture, and um, it can also precipitate a stress fracture in your heel bones. So I really try to limit those and, and try these other treatments above first that I listed. Now, the vast majority of patients with plantar fasciitis will respond to all of these treatments. It's only a very small percentage of patients that fail conservative treatment and then need to start considering surgical options. And we'll talk about that a little more in a bit. Now, there's also Achilles tendonitis, which is another cause of heel pain. Now, generally patients will come in with pain at the back of their ankle. It can be burning, throbbing, aching. And there's two places where it can hurt. It can hurt either in the middle of the tendon, and sometimes if you, if you touch it, it feels bulbous and enlarged. And then as far as the attachment to the heel bone itself, that's another common area of inflammation in Achilles tendonitis. Some patients may either have one location or the other inflamed, and some patients can have both areas inflamed. Again, the most common causes include tight calf muscles because it is the Achilles tendon that attaches the calf muscles to the heel bone. So if those calf muscles are tight, it's gonna put a lot of stress and strain where that Achilles tendon is attaching to the heel. And ultimately it can cause inflammation and chronic degeneration of the tissue. Uh, injury. Achilles tendons can certainly be injured uh, in exercise activities, sporting activities, especially in conjunction with that tight calf muscle. It's just going to put a lot of excessive load and strain on that Achilles tendon. Patients with flat feet are also prone to developing Achilles tendonitis because, again, with a flat foot, a flat foot is an unstable foot. So these tendons have to fire more often in order to stabilize your foot. And also with the flat foot, it puts the Achilles tendon in a different position than where it's supposed to be in relation to the back of the heel. So that does put extra stress on it as well. And also allows that calf muscle to tighten even more. I also see it in high arch feet because in a higher arch foot, as the arch sits higher, it puts extra stretch on the Achilles tendon. And that in turn will stress the tendon both at, at its insertion and in the mid substance of the tendon as well. So for Achilles tendonitis, treatments include stretching just as in plantar fasciitis, ice or heat, anti-inflammatories, arch supports, and supportive shoes. Again, all these treatments are the same as in plantar fasciitis, and they're both trying to, to support the, the same issues and reduce stress on that Achilles tendon. Physical therapy is also very important in Achilles tendonitis as well. I'm a huge advocate of it. Um, what you're seeing done here is called Graston, and this is one of the modalities that I prescribe in physical therapy for my Achilles tendon patients. And it involves using a series of instruments that help break up adhesions and scar tissue and, and reduce uh, inflammation along the course of that Achilles tendon. Alfredson's technique is also another technique used, which involves um, various, it's called concentric and eccentric strength to kind of uh, train that Achilles tendon to gradually stretch out and lengthen those, uh, those calf muscles to take the stress off the Achilles as well as strengthening the muscles too. So again, just like in plantar fasciitis, with Achilles tendonitis, the vast majority of patients 
will respond well to conservative treatments. There's only a small percentage that needs to go on to more aggressive or invasive treatments. Now, traditionally, if a patient failed conservative treatment for either the plantar fasciitis or the Achilles tendonitis, we would go to a full open surgery, which is a large incision and, and release of the plantar fascia or going in and, and actually sharply uh, cleaning up or we call debriding that Achilles tendon. Um, so that is something that, um, I don't wanna do this. Let's X that out. Hold on one sec. Let's go back one. I apologize. So anyway, with the um, with the traditional procedures, it does require an open incision and debridement of those tissues, and and that's not something that should be taken lightly. It is a long recovery, and we we try to avoid that whenever possible. Several years ago, this technology called 10X came out. And the great thing about it is it's an alternative to uh, traditional surgery. And the vast majority of patients who have failed conservative treatment do get relief. Now, what it involves is a special handpiece that emits an ultrasonic frequency that's calibrated to break down and remove damaged tissue while leaving healthy tissue in both the plantar fascia and the Achilles tendon. And it stimulates production of healthy collagen in the areas of disease, disease tissue that was removed. Now this is a minimal incision surgery and it is done under a local anesthetic. It does not require an IV, it does not require um, any type of general anesthesia. And it is something that I do perform at the surgical center. Now, Open surgery is still an option if the 10X procedure fails to relieve pain. But we've also used the 10X procedure after failed open surgery. So it is a, it is a great minimally invasive option. Now the general indications for the 10X procedure are plantar fasciitis and the Achilles tendonitis or tendinosis as we discussed, both in the middle of the tendon and where it inserts to the uh, the keel bone. Plantar fibromas is another place where we can use 10x as well and there are abnormal growths that can occur in the substance of the plantar fascia. Now before we do the 10x procedure generally I'll order an MRI or an ultrasound to confirm the diagnosis and also to take a look at the quality of the tissue and see how inflamed it is. Generally, anyone who has failed six months of conservative treatment would be a potential candidate. If you are diabetic, your hemoglobin A1C must be below eight because we don't want you to have any potential risks or complications like infection. Also, we do, uh, and we do want smoking cessation prior to the procedure as well because again, smoking can inhibit healing. I do also recommend no aspirin seven days before the procedure because of the bleeding risk and no anti-inflammatories like Advil or Aleve, for example, three days before the procedure because that can also cause some bleeding, but also NSAIDs are something that can inhibit what I'm trying to accomplish with the procedure. Now, afterwards, I recommend Tylenol is needed for the pain and no NSAIDs, again, because anti-inflammatories can inhibit the inflammatory process that I'm trying to create so that we can get new collagen. I will uh, put patients in a CAN boot and limit their activity for two weeks until their follow-up visit. And then if everything's going well at the two-week follow-up, they'll have another follow-up uh, four weeks later which is six weeks postoperatively. At that point, if there's still any type of discomfort, I will recommend physical therapy if needed. I generally tell patients, it's gonna take at least 12 weeks for you to see the majority of the results and definitely up to six months before you can get a feel for what your full result will be. Now this just gives you a look at what the instrument I, I use looks like. This is the hand piece and this tip here is demonstrated larger up here. This is a 
a needle with a sheath on the outside. There's saline that is squirted through here to help flush the tissues. And what I do is I use this needle to, it's a back and forth motion to poke at the diseased tissue and uh, try to break it up and then suck any diseased tissue back through the needle and then um, clear out that space. This is all done under ultrasound. So I'm watching as I do it the whole time using ultrasound guidance. Again, this gives you another closer look at the needle tip that I'm using uh, as part of the hand piece. And this is what it, it looks like in the operating room. So this is the 10X hand piece here. This is the ultrasound probe here. And I'm ultimately using this ultrasound as, as I'm watching on a screen and through a very small incision, I am breaking up that, that tissue. These are a couple of the studies um, that have come out recently. Now, when people who have had the procedure done for Achilles tendonitis, there's about an 85% success rate. And with plantar fasciitis, there's about a 96% success rate. So overall, these are pretty good uh, success rates uh, for people who've been in quite a bit of pain. And our goal is ultimately to get you pain-free if possible and back to your normal life and normal activities. So that's what I have as far as the material. I'm going to open it up to questions now. Um, so um, Natalie, I'm not sure how you'd like to proceed with the questions. Sure. I mean, if you want, I, there's only a couple in the chat section um, as of now, but if people want to, you know, keep on writing them in there, we can answer. Um, either you can pull it up or I can read them. Yeah, you know, could you, could you read them, please? Sure. Um, now, let's see. The first one is, is Haglund's the same as a heel spur? And I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. You did pronounce it, yes. So, <laughs> so Haglund's and a, and a traditional heel spur are slightly different. Um, let me see if I can go back to that very first slide with the x-ray. There we go. So with the Haglund's deformity, the Haglund's is actually sits a little further back on the heel, and that's just a natural bony deformity that occurs in some patients. Now, here where the bone spur is, that's a little different. That's directly where the Achilles tendon attaches, and it's the chronic pulling of the Achilles tendon that forms the bone spur. The Achilles is not attaching to the Haglund's. The Haglund sits actually behind or deep to the Achilles tendon. So they are two different entities. Okay. Someone says, I was told to do a stretch for 30 seconds every 30 minutes, 30 times a day. Then I got my orthotics inserts to be worn all day. Do I still need to do the stretching exercises? So what I tell patients is that in, in some patients, you're just naturally tight. Some patients, I, I have it myself, I just have naturally tight calf muscles. And I have a history of plantar fasciitis myself. So if I don't keep up with my stretching, the plantar fasciitis eventually does come back. So I do recommend um, that patients um, try to uh, keep up with their stretching and I kind of liken it to brushing your teeth. So you've got to brush your teeth every day to avoid cavities. So I recommend, um, you know, stretching every day to avoid the heel pain coming back. Awesome. Next question is, is 10X generally covered by health insurance? Yes, it is. It is considered a surgical procedure and it is billed as a surgical code. Uh, depending on what your particular de surgical deductible is with your insurance will depend on what type of financial responsibility you have. But it is something that we do pre-certify and pre-authorize before doing the procedure. Without heading to physical therapy, can you give us a few general stretches? So with um, the, the most common one I recommend is, is called the towel stretch. It's done seated. And if you're sitting, you're going to straighten your leg uh, and you make sure your knee's straight and locked. And then you can take a towel or a belt and loop it around the end of your foot. 
and then you gently pull back till you feel a nice stretch in your calf muscle and also your arch and you hold it for 30 seconds and then relax and go to the other side. Um, that's probably my favorite stretch because it's a controlled stretch. You're using your arms to help control it. You can also do that stretch without the towel just by straightening your knee and pulling your toes uh, back, essentially back to your nose and just, just hold it for 30 seconds. Um, the two standing stretches I generally recommend are the wall stretch where you, you kind of put your hands against the wall at shoulder level and, and you bend into the wall with um, the, the side you're not stretching has a bent knee and the side you are stretching, you have that leg extended behind you with your heel on the ground. So they're the most common ones I recommend. Okay. Someone asked about what stretching exercise could you recommend for the calf and heel to relieve pain? So I think you answered that. Mm -hmm. um, is the recovery time for Achilles the same as plantar? Um, you know, every patient's different. Uh, I would say, based on my experience over the past 20 years, it does take longer in the majority of patients to uh, resolve Achilles tendonitis than plantar fasciitis. However, you know, there are some patients who the plantar fasciitis lingers and the Achilles clears right up. But generally, Achilles is a little trickier. It does take a little longer. Okay. Um, someone messaged me privately and said, um, I was looking to see if you could discuss Severs heel treatments. Um, oh, okay. Like Severs disease. Severs, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's though. That's good. So what that's referring to, this happens in kids. Um, so on the back of the heel, where, where you're actually this area where you're seeing the spur, um, when we're, we're kids, we have a, a, a secondary, uh, it's called a secondary ossification center there. There's a growth plate. And in kids, uh, a lot of times who are athletic, and usually I see it in kids with flatter feet, um, between the ages of nine and 12, that growth plate can become very inflamed. And that's called Seaver's disease. It doesn't go away until that growth plate uh, fuses, and that can be anywhere from like 12 to 14 years old. So generally for those kids, I, I initially will recommend the stretching exercises, the ice, um, uh, sometimes putting a little heel lift in the shoe can help. Uh, in real, uh, if they have an acute flare up, I may temporarily immobilize them in a boot. And, um, and sometimes it also does require a course of physical therapy to resolve it. Is it worth having surgery for plantar fasciitis with 10X if I have right calf muscles, tight calf muscles, and it comes back anyway? Well, generally in, with my treatment protocol with patients, I do at least try to get uh, some physical therapy under the belt so that we can at least get the calf muscles stretched out as much as possible. Um, and then after the physical therapy, if they're still having pain, the procedure is an option. Um, again, some people are just naturally tight. No matter what they do, they still have tight calf muscles. And if you get an ultrasound or an MRI and that tissue is, is just significantly inflamed on the MRI, the 10X still could be a viable option as a treatment because at least you can try to calm down that inflammation and, and remove the disease tissue and try to encourage the body to lay down new collagen and healthy tissue. Does the 10X actually influence the bone spur on Achilles or just the damaged tissue? I have a golf ball size enlargement that I assume is a bone spur. If a bone spur is incredibly large and that is where the majority of the pain is, and if it's really the size of a golf ball, in that case, I would recommend just proceeding with open surgery to, which it's more invasive, it does involve uh, removing the Achilles tendon from the back of the heel, cutting down that spur or that enlarged bone, and then reattaching the Achilles. Next question is, when should we use heat or cold therapy? Generally, initially, I'll go with ice first because I'm trying to calm down inflammation. Um, so usually in the initial uh, phases of, of acute treatment, I'll do that. 
Um, some patients just do not tolerate ice and feel more comfortable with heat. So in that case, I I'll go ahead with heat. Um, later on in treatment, heat can be helpful because it, it tends to relax the tissues. Um, but initially, I'm just trying to cool down that inflammation. So that's why I usually go to ice first. Do you perform these and other foot procedures at our Ben Salem location? So, what was the question again? I'm sorry. They asked if you perform these and other foot procedures at the Ben Salem location. Uh, no, I am uh, in office hours on Mondays in the Northeast Philadelphia office and Tuesday through Friday in Center City. Uh, these procedures that I do, I perform at the Riverview Surgical Center at the Navy Yard uh, in South Philadelphia. Okay. That was the last question in the chat. Um, does anyone have any other questions that they want to type in. Um, I can also allow people to um, unmute themselves if anybody wanted to ask a question. Oh, here's another one. Um, somebody said, what is the first step in getting started to consider? I assume 10 minutes. Um, anyone, you know, I'd be happy to, you know, see anyone in the office if they want to discuss it further. Um, anyone who has already undergone a, a series of conservative treatment and just isn't getting where they want to, you know, would certainly be a candidate. And, you know, this definitely would um, be, you know, helpful uh, to, to meet with you first and, and review your options. Okay, one more. Does plantar fasciitis cause excruciating calf muscle cramps, especially at night? Or is this simply fatigue, dehydration, or magnesium deficiencies? Dr. Wellen, do you mute it yourself, I think, by accident? I can't hear you. We can't hear you. In the bottom left corner, if you click the mute. One second, I, could, I, I think I could do it for you, let me. Sorry, everyone. Oh, there we go. Okay, back. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so, so, I'm sorry, what was that last question? I'll repeat the question. So, it's, um, someone asked, does plantar fasciitis cause excruciating calf muscle cramps, especially at night? Or is this simply fatigue, dehydration, or magnesium deficiencies? Well, plantar fasciitis itself can be caused by tight calf muscles. So if you have calf muscles, it can certainly, hold on, I just got to move for a sec. It's a little loud. I apologize. Um, yeah, with, with plantar fasciitis, um, it, it can be caused by tight calf muscles. And with tight calf muscles, um, that in itself can cause cramping. The other things that you listed as well certainly can too. So it's just a matter of figuring out what's, what's causing it exactly. Um, orthotics, what kind? So there's all sorts of types of orthotics. The first place you can get orthotics is like the drugstore, um, you know, uh, the prefabricated ones, like the Dr. Scholl's. Um, the next tier up would be a prefabricated medical grade one. We actually have a really nice one available here um, and uh, patients seem to do really well with it. Now the top of the line ones are the custom molded ones. They're the ones that we actually cast you for and they are something that you can um, get but they're expensive and most insurances do not cover them. And does a night splint have any benefit? You know, night splints, some patients can tolerate them, some can't. Uh, if plantar fasciitis is something you've been dealing with or Achilles tendonitis and you haven't responded to the other ones, it is another alternative uh, treatment option. Um, I don't usually go to it right away, though, because if it's the first thing you do, that in itself can cause a lot of cramping. Um, someone asked custom mold or versus foot lever or foot lever? Custom molded versus foot lever. I'm not sure. Not sure what the foot 
foot level foot leveler. Oh, foot leveler. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> sorry, she she uh, she. Gotcha. I, I know what they're talking about. They're the ones that the <laughs> uh, the chiropractors have in their office. Um, the problem with the foot levelers I found is they don't really correct in all the planes. You don't get a lot of great um, in, the, in the back of the heel. You don't get a lot of great rear foot uh, correction. So I, I don't see fantastic results with the foot levelers. All right. That was the last question that came in. Anyone else have any questions? All right, well, if, if no one has any more questions um, and you can feel free to, e you all have my email address that I sent um, the link through. So you can always, if you, you find yourself thinking later and, and you have a question, feel free to reach out to me and I can get the answer for, for you from Dr. Wellens. Um, and we will be sending out this recording as well um, throughout uh, by the end of the week so that you can review it or maybe pass it along to someone that you think may benefit from it um, as well. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Dr. Wellens and thank everyone you, have a great night. Thanks. All right, thank you.